Uh, the first question I get asked more than once, why is it that any lawyer uh, should have the temerity to speak about a topic like COVID, which rises a series of epidemiological and medical issues? Uh, and I think it's really worth giving an answer. And part of the answer comes from the question is, what is it that lawyers actually do? And uh, most people's conception of a lawyer is sort of a grand version of a notary public who spends his time or her time uh, dealing with sort of filling out forms of one kind or another or doing pleadings in court. I am not a practicing lawyer. I'm an academic. And as such, I spent a lot of time in universities. I've worked with Centers for Clinical Medical Ethics at the University of Chicago for over 40 years. And in the courses that I have taught, uh, many of them have to do with the kinds of issues that are relevant here. Administrative law is certainly one issue that you have to worry about, given the rather preemptory way in which these decisions come down from state officials. Uh, but it's also important to know that when you teach stuff having to do with liability, whether it be product liability or any other kind of form of public nuisance, uh, the only way that you could actually work through these particular problems is to know something about the science that are involved with respect to the underlying disputes. Um, and so what I have done over the years, starting with the AIDS disputes back in the early 1980s, is to develop a kind of an armchair sophistication associated with the ways in which you ought to be able to understand these pandemic epidemics and other kinds of situations. Uh, that's the grand story. And the narrow story begins with, A, my greatest intellectual blunder, and what I sometimes like to think my real intellectual triumph. Uh, back in mid-March, it was quite clear that uh, something was coming down the road called COVID. And if you recall, by about March 1st, people started to make very strong adaptations with respect to their behavior. And the last public event that I did before everything was shut down was on March 9th. And it was a debate about antitrust law with Tim Wu, a noted scholar from Columbia. And people were bunching elbows with one another, using Purell, making sure that they did not touch their eyes or their nose. It was clear that adaptive behavior was beginning to take place. Uh, travel on airlines uh, had dropped by 60 or 70 percent that month. And so what you saw was that people were beginning to anticipate things and trying to figure out exactly how they ought to respond to them. And then on March 15th or 16th, the New York Times uh, published an editorial with Nick Kristoff. And what it did is it projected what they thought would be the anticipation or uh, the consequences associated with the impending uh, COVID situation. And the draft that they gave, I won't put it on the papers, basically assumed that there would be a slow rise in the number of cases until about July 1st, at which point things would start to spike. And by July 15th, you would have about 9.4 million active cases, after which the number would go down so that by the time we got to early August, everything would be virtually back to zero and it would disappear. So essentially what would happen, you'd have this huge spasmodic situation and a six month run. That was the initial type situation. But then there was the question about what is it that we're supposed to do about this? And it was a very common notion to say it was appropriate to flatten the curve which meant that you'd extend this thing a little bit longer. And the hope was that if you extended it longer, instead of having the million or 2 million deaths that were projected uh, with the original spike, uh, the peaks would go lower, the total number of cases would go over, and so that you would do things a little bit better. And I took one look at that graph and I said, this has to be wrong. And in order to understand why it has to be wrong, you have to know something about the cycles of uh, epidemiological behavior. And essentially, there are two phases in this world. One of them is a silent phase. It's a phase in which there is a virus, but it has not manifested itself in any serious way to any particular person. Um, and so what happens is it tends to spread very rapidly at a kind of a geometric rate. Uh, so if one person then infects 2.75 persons, each of those people infect somebody else, and you run an exponential expansion. And then once things become uh, knowledgeable, what people do is they start to take some kind of reaction to it so that the rate of spread starts to go down. And then the question is just how fast does it go down? There is nothing about this particular model which says that you will not wipe out an entire population. It may well be that you can't get the rate slow enough to stop this thing from killing everybody. And with isolated communities, that often happens. But when you're dealing with a disease like COVID, 
which can spread worldwide, essentially the reactions will generally prevent this thing from doing uh, the most horrible things imaginable, and you will get some kind of a stasis. And so you're trying to figure out exactly what that is going to be. And the first thing you realize is if you're publishing this article on March 15th, it turns out that you're no longer in the silent phase. You're already in the reactive phase. And so the correct prediction that you have to make is that it will not take you three or four months in order to get to the peak. It will happen very much more quickly than that. And in fact, in the first round, subject to qualifications that I'll mention, the peak actually came around April 6th. And there was a fairly high infection rate and a fairly high percentage of deaths coming out of this. And then the thing started to go down again until we had a mild second wave in the summer and then a very severe second race coming on. The stupid thing I said when I went through all of this stuff was to extrapolate from the South Korean experience to try to estimate the number of deaths. And I picked and quickly corrected a number of about 500. But it's quite clear that the correct number was never going to be anything close uh, to a million deaths. And so it's the negative stuff that mattered. And the other stuff was just a stupid mistake, which I corrected as quickly as possible. Uh, so the question then is, uh, what is the pattern that we have? How does it take place? And what does it tell us about the civic institution? Well, the first thing to note is that when you're dealing with a virus, you're not dealing with a uniform thing. Um, you're dealing with something which is always going to have not one quality, but many qualities. And the system of natural selection says that whether you're talking about the height of the human being or the genetic composition of a coronavirus, there's gonna be some natural variation in the population. Uh, some of these viruses are gonna be more potent than others. And some of course are going to be less. And then when you start to deal with people, you're gonna find the same level of variation. There are gonna be some people who are more resistant to the virus, and there are going to be other people who are going to be less resistant to the virus. And so when you're trying to plot out the rate of spread, what you have to do is to figure out how any random interaction will start to take place. And then what you have to do is to ask the further question, well, what are the initial set of interactions going to do to the mixture of strong and weak viruses that you have as you start going through the iterations? And the standard pattern that starts to emerge is that once it turns out that people are aware uh, that there is something about the virus that can kill them, they start to adapt their behavior. And when they start to adapt their behavior, what happens is that the time between one person's contact and another increases. So if you have viruses that are extremely strong, they are more likely to kill their host or incapacitate their host before they can spread to somebody else if that time is long. But if the time gets shorter, then exactly the opposite phenomenon is gonna take place. These things will spread and the viruses become stronger rather than becoming weaker. And so this pattern exists on one side and on human beings, I've gone back and read some of the studies and it turns out the way in which individual immune systems react often respond to the kinds of stimuluses that they could have. And you don't have to wait generations to see these things changing. If people, for example, are subject to small levels of exposure, like cowpox as opposed to chickenpox, it turns out that they can develop very quickly certain kinds of responses so as to give them essentially a form of vaccination against the strongest stuff. Well, unbeknownst to just about everybody, in March of uh, 2020, uh, many governors, including Governor Cuomo in New York, issued orders. And what the orders said, in effect, is that they were to take people out of the hospitals who were COVID positive and force the private nursing homes to admit them, saying that they kept them out. It was discrimination on the grounds of health, and so therefore would expose them to various kinds of liability under the disability insurance. So if you want to know why it is that we don't like anti-discrimination laws, it's exactly this kind of reason. So what happened is uh, they did this because they had these wrong estimates about the number of cases being up there in the hundreds of thousands. If you recall in New York, they took the Javits Center and they converted it into beds. They brought hospital ships in from so forth. And all those things remained empty because the original projections were way high because the adaptive responses were already starting to slow things down at least a little. Once you start taking these very vulnerable people and put them into nursing homes, you reverse the practice. And so the virus will get stronger because it's going to spread more and more rapidly and it's not going to be kept in this particular hermetic seal. It's going to slowly leak out. We exactly, exactly how nobody's quite sure, 
who's going to be the carriers, who's not going to be the carriers, and so forth. And so what you did is you basically prolonged this situation with respect to the first kind of government intervention uh, that you started to have. And so then the question is, what should you try to do about this? And also in March, there was a very fatal public statement by President Trump, who in his more definite mode announced that he'd heard about this drug called HCQ, hydroxychloroquine, uh, which had been said to have been effective in dealing with other kinds of viruses and influences beforehand. And Anthony Fauci is standing in the back row and he comes forward and he says, uh, don't trust that particular drug because it has not been subjected to a double blind clinical trial, a uh, reputably constructed, which will show that it is effective. And so what he did is they started to put the quash on this particular drug. Uh, the drug is used in combination with zinc and a chemical known as erythromycin um, in many places throughout the world. It's like much of medicine. Uh, it's a combination of empirical observation on the one hand and theory on the other. Uh, the theory, in fact, runs something like this, which is it says that the erythromycin is something which essentially is an anti-inflammatory, which can help if you start uh, getting into fluids into the lungs and so forth. The zinc is an agent which tends to disrupt the replication of the virus. And the HCQ is an envelope which carries that inside the system. And there are large numbers of people who thought it worked well. And in fact, this particular drug has been tried and used successfully in many other advanced countries, Nigeria, Bangladesh, India, and so forth, with a high level of success. In the United States, once the um, HCQ was nixed by uh, Fauci, who then, in fact, he and the FDA decided that it was on the discouraged list, uh, it turned out we have no effective treatment that we give to people uh, before they enter into hospital, unlike other kinds of countries. Now, having taught the FDA, uh, of course, many times, one of the things that you realize is that Mr. Fauci just got the basic science of this thing wrong. A double-blind clinical trial done over large numbers of people is often a sufficient condition to show that a particular drug works. And so if you have conditions like, you know, uh, high cholesterol and so forth, and you can give people drugs for that, you get very, very large populations on which to test it, and you can get these very strong results. But when you try to run clinical trials of a double blind virus in real time against an evolving virus, uh, the method simply does not work. You have to get people at exactly the right time in the cycle. You have to get the right kind of combination of drugs being uh, put into them. You have to have people who know what other kinds of collateral treatment are going to give. And so a kind of a trial and error method is probably something that works better. And then what you try to do is to collect field um, um, evidence of one kind or another and put it all together to see what comes out. And that's the way in which this worked with HCQ. Uh, when you're worried about a drugs, there are two things that you're worried about. Uh, one of them turns out to be its adverse side effects. And the great advantage of HCQ is it's been on the market since about 1955. It's been used in billions and billions of cases after multiple conditions. And so they're pretty confident that it doesn't have any adverse side effect because those would have shown up the Acid test for any drug is whether or not you will prescribe it to pregnant women. And it turns out that HCQ for these conditions, many of which, for example, are related to malaria, are in fact uh, approved for that particular use. So then the only question is, what do you have to lose under these circumstances? It may be ineffective, nothing lost. It may be effective, true. And then what you have to do is to figure out exactly what percentage of the population is going to be benefited and why. And what you want to ask yourself is, given the incomplete information that we have, do you have a higher expected safety yield by trying the drug than not? And even though there's no double-blind clinical trial, most people who assemble and evaluate medical evidence are willing to piece together bits and pieces. And there are several websites, including one run by a Hasidic doctor named Vladimir Gazenko, who collates every single study that's ever been done and runs what they call meta-studies, finding that they're strong, consistent, positive effects. None of this has influenced anything that takes place with the CDC or with uh, uh, Anthony Fauci. And so the drug is still put on some kind of a marginal list. Some governors, including Governor Whitmer in Michigan, have gone so far as to ban, this is not allowed to them, but they do it anyhow, the use of these drugs within their own jurisdiction. And one starts to see the rates go up. So that's one of the problems that we have now.
is government intervention uh, makes the disease worse. We've seen that with respect to the way uh, people do the false progn uh, prognosis and forecast. We see it with respect to the forcing of people into nursing homes when they're sick. We see it with respect to the medicine. And then the next thing you do is what about quarantines and various kinds of prohibitions? How do you want to evaluate those sorts of things? And here, the basic model that we have in the United States today is one which I like to call quarantine until vaccine. And the basic inclination that people have under these particular circumstances is we treat this thing as a very deadly, very serious kind of disease. We move heaven and earth to make sure that nobody is going to be exposed to it. And the moment they are exposed to it, what we do is we put them into quarantine. If we're worried about them possibly having it, uh, what we do is we prohibit various kinds of uh, interstate transportation on airplanes and require people who want to go from one location to another to quarantine two weeks, get COVID tests, and do lots else. The question is, does this or does this not make sense? And I think the answer is it's a very dangerous strategy uh, to engage in that because the virus is too clever. It finds way to escape the quarantines, and the quarantine, in fact, slows down the rate at which immunization is going to take place. And so there's a very important, very complicated topic that needs to be discussed here about the appropriate treatment of asymptomatic risk and what ought to be done. Um, I gather Scott Atlas spoke to you and he took the position, he's a friend and colleague of mine, uh, that there was nothing much to fear from asymptomatic transactions and perhaps something to welcome from it. He was then denounced, uh, I along with him, by his Stanford colleagues who were saying that, you know, this is reckless endangerment of thousands upon thousands of people. But the science here is much more complicated than that. And it goes back to the issue that I started to talk to you about moments ago, namely the question of what do we do with the variants that we have in A, the resistance to disease that people have, and B, in the strength of the disease um, as it starts coming across individuals. And so go back again to Edward Jenner and his famous experiment. Uh, what was his vaccine for smallpox? It was cowpox. Cowpox was a more mild version of the same disease. And if you got it, you then started to develop the various kinds of antibodies that would allow you to resist the invading cells. Uh, and so you could fight back. And if you start looking, the question is, can an asymptomatic transmission of disease serve in some sense as a a vaccine which will prevent its further spread. In order to see how this might work, what I'd like to take you back to for a moment is some of the rather interesting statistics that develop in connection with uh, the vaccine and the flu that took place in 1918, the Spanish flu, and to try and figure out what these numbers mean and how they ought to be understood. And the first thing to understand is the population in the United States in the a fall of 1918 as World War I was winding down was about 100 million people. It's also the case that the flu came with tremendous speed, uh, shot up, level, shot down and disappeared over about an eight or nine week period. Uh, the number of deaths that took place in that time was 675,000. The number of people who were infected was about 22 million, which works out roughly being uh, to the fact that you've got about a 2.5 conversion to death rate. You look at the population that is injured and it shows you a completely different profile from the one that we have today. And the most common age group for death was ordinary people between the ages of about 25 and 40, 25 and 35, depending on where you're going. And virtually 90% of the people who died had serious pneumonia by what they call the cytokine rush which was when the body is, sees that the attacking antigen is coming in, it spends this fluids out. And when you did the autopsies, people's lungs looked as though they had been gassed on the German front. That's how bad this thing was. 2.5% uh, represents probably a 25% in, rather, uh, sorry, that, uh, a 25 fold increase over the number of deaths that you get from ordinary influenza for that group, about 0.1%. Well, if you then figure out you've gotten 22 million people infected and the thing stopped, the standard figure with respect to herb immunity is one which says that you need to have say 60, 70 or 80%, depending on the virus and the rate of transmission and so forth to stop it. This thing stopped dead in its tracks and there were no vaccines. And so the best guess is that there were probably many, many asymptomatic transfers, 
and that those, in fact, were the, the viruses that kept the thing from spreading. And today, we don't believe that. And there's a very good reason why to be suspicious about this and stronger reasons why to understand that the theory makes sense. As I indicated to you, when you're dealing with viruses, uh, you have a range of distribution, the strength of the virus and the strength of the immune system. And the simplest way in which to do this is to forget about the continuous distribution and just to talk about high immunities and low immunities, weak viruses and strong viruses. If in fact you've got somebody who um, has a strong immunity and he is attacked by a weak virus, of course this thing will be just fine and he will spread it to lots of other people and they will be continued to be weak. The real danger comes when you have somebody with a very strong immune system who's attacked by a very strong virus. That person can survive that, but when that person asymptomatically transfers it to somebody else, the level of the strength may be strong enough to kill that person so if you look at the modern literature, you see discuss but not explain uh, the category of super spreaders. That is certain kinds of individuals who don't seem to suffer from anything, but probably spread it in a fairly high way. It's estimated at being about 2% of the total population. I'm not in a position to quarrel with those kinds of estimates. So then the question is, what about the other people? And it may well be that what we have done is decided that in order to stop the super spreaders, we stop those people who are transmitting asymptomatically in ways that give you a kind of a proxy by way of vaccine. Uh, so that what happens is you manage to spread the herd immunity somewhat more broadly than would otherwise be the case. This is just a theoretical statement, uh, but the implication in fact is to some extent very, very disturbing because if it turns out that this model is in fact correct, then in effect, the strong isolationist tendencies that we have are going to start to increase what's going on. This then has gone rise to a huge political debate, which I think it's probably worth mentioning to you. There is uh, the great Barrington Declaration with eminent, uh, basically epidemiologists from Oxford, Stanford, and Harvard, who essentially say what you do is you try to protect and isolate the very, very sick people uh, with tests and protocols. And it is the case that unlike the flu that we had in 1918, 80% um, or a huge fraction of people are over 70 or 75. And one of the really striking statistics that you have is that 99 point something or other percent of people who died, for example, in New York State, um, virtually all had serious comorbidities. And there were very few people who were like the 1918 sample where virtually everybody died were perfectly healthy people they go to work at 27 years of age and they come home dead that night uh, because the virus and the cytokine reaction starts to take them out. And so then the question is, how is it you count these people? And here's where you find yet another government error, which I think is extremely important. You are told by noted health experts that the way in which you ought to count these people is to treat them all as COVID deaths. And so if you look at the current statistics of 400,000 dead, and so forth, it's all treated as though it's COVID and the comorbidity is ignored. If you go back to traditional analysis with respect to death certificates, you will note that they all have A cause B, which was due to C, which was due to C, because virtually in the end, everybody dies of sepsis or pneumonia or something, but the causes beforehand are there. So the question then is how do you start to approximate the relative contributions of these two things? And interestingly enough, that's a legal question. Um, on which lawyers have spent a lot of time trying to figure out what you do with the theory of proximate causation when you have successive agents that give you that. And it turns out there's a fairly nice way in which you could look at this. What you do is you take a person of a given age and assume that they have no comorbidity and then ask the following question. What's their life expectancy without the, um, any particular conditions? Say you're um, 78 years of age and you've got a 10 year life expectancy. Then what you do is you throw on top of that a cancer, and it turns out that life expectancy goes from 10 to one year. Then you throw on top of that COVID, uh, which starts to kill somebody in six months. Uh, the basic intuition would be uh, that 90% of that death should go on the cancer column, and 10% should go on the comorbidity, uh, or should we go on this, the, the, the COVID test. So if you do that over huge populations, those numbers start to drop very, very radically, and then that gets you a number of, say, instead of 400,000, a number of 40 or 50,000, given the comorbidity problem, 
Once you see that that's the number, then the question is, should you keep the same strategies of you know, quarantine until vaccine, or should you switch to the great Barrington strategies, which is to try to isolate people with very high vulnerabilities, test anybody who wants to go with them, and leave the rest of the population, which is less vulnerable to death from doing this. This is not an easy question. There's also a lot of evidence uh, that some people who get COVID don't die from it, but they suffer long complications, loss of smell, taste, various kinds of low level interference. So you're not exactly sure exactly how this thing ought to break. But the one thing you are pretty confident about is that if in fact you overestimate the causal contribution of COVID to these deaths, you're going to start to put into place excessive kinds of protections against them, which may well turn out to be counterproductive. Uh, so if you start looking at the Barrington crowd and think about the stuff yourself, you can see yet another set of government mistakes that has involved in this. So in New York State, and I was in New York City by when this happened last uh, April, and they, it's, they shut down all medical facilities. Uh, it turns out, of course, doctors are not transferable. Your orthopedic surgeon doesn't know much about pulmonary diseases. And so what you do is you get people putting off their cancer tests, their routine x-rays and so forth. This is going to have an adverse effect on longevity and general health. And you're gonna attribute it to COVID is the standard kind of response. But the correct response is you attribute it not to COVID, you attribute it to the over-response of government, which was the last act which gave this particular kind of behavior. And then what you do is you start putting in various kinds of quarantine, where in fact, it may well be that young people uh, exposed one to another may spread the immunities rather than spread the disease. It turns out you then have all sorts of physical separations in schools and classes and quarantines, and then you get what now has become a great political dispute, the mask, as to whether they should or should not be worn. And to understand masks, again, what you have to do is you have to do the theory before you do the empiric. And there are basically four settings you want to think about. Uh, essentially, you could be with or without a mask, you could be inside or you could be outside. And it turns out that if you're outside, generally speaking, uh, the stuff will dissipate into the air and that mask will do nothing uh, because they can't stop you from exhaling. And uh, even if you're wearing a mask, it's gonna go through the mask and around the mask, it's going to do it. Uh, so you don't want for the most part to treat that as a place where you cover it. Uh, statements that you could save 100,000 lives by wearing masks all the time instead of at the right time is made by people who don't understand the difference between marginal benefits and marginal cost and taking both into account. If you go inside and you're in very close contact with somebody and there's a danger of directly breathing upon them, if you're a dentist, if you're a beautician, if you're any kind of physician, you darn well ought to wear a particular mask, but the mask is not going to be sufficient of the ordinary sort. They have to be better masks and they also have to have rooms in which the ventilation systems are extremely strong so that you circulate the air because otherwise what happens is the ambient air from people who have COVID, uh, they will still expel that. They may not spit on anybody, but they're gonna create something which can then land on other individuals. So you have to take the right kinds of precautions under these circumstances. So it's important to understand that the benefits of masks are very high in some places and very low in the others. And you would like individuals and institutions to do this. The danger of running government into this situation is it gives an all-purpose edict, which essentially puts on masks where they're probably not desired. And it's not as though they don't have adverse consequences. Uh, if you're an older person and you have to breathe through a mask, your respiration is gonna be negatively affected. If you're wearing a mask too often, it may well contain other kinds of germs. If it turns out that you're infected and you're breathing in through a mask, uh, the mask will direct the stuff back up to your nose and through your eyes, and so you may engage in uh, reinfection and so forth. You try to measure this empirically. It turns out it's extremely difficult to do so on any of these uh, uh, types of situations. There are huge numbers of studies that you look at on this and on lockdowns and so forth. Uh, the better studies, which I just sort of reviewed this afternoon, uh, suggest that these things really don't work. As one doctor put it very profoundly, he says, the virus does what it will do regardless of what we do, um, which is obviously a bit too nihilistic, uh, but the basic point has been uh, that what you discover with quarantines and with masks is that it turns out that you have high levels of danger and you have large precautions, 
but it's extremely difficult to show that the precautions have reduced the level that has happened. Uh, so if you go to Scandinavia, where they've had successes, nobody wore masks, whether you're in Sweden or Norway or in Denmark, uh, essentially they said for children and for other people, it's just not worth doing and their rates have been lower. There are differences amongst them because other policies matter and other individual situations matter. So this then leads you to the last question that I'm gonna talk about. Exactly how does this relate to the role of government? Keone said he wanted me to address this and, and let me see if I can do so in the following way. If you look at all of these kinds of decisions, what you discover is there's a legal concept that's involved about the police power and there's an administrative law concept that's involved about the question of what kinds of notice and hearings you have to give in order for these things to take place. And the legal concept that we're talking about is called the police power. And what it says pretty categorically is that if you are dealing with a system of ordinary liberty, the government can nonetheless decide to regulate what is going on that would normally be free in order to protect uh, the health, safety, morals, and general welfare of the public. This is not meant to be a left-wing liberal situation. It was the very conception of the police power that was used in the late 19th and earliest 20th century when we got as close as we ever did to anything that you might want to call laissez-faire constitutionalism. Uh, but the notion is, in fact, with respect to quarantines, uh, clearly if you're going to have the bubonic plague and so forth, the government does not have to stand by side helplessly in order to make sure these things go. The question then is just exactly how much deference do you give to the state when it starts to do this? When I first wrote about this in uh, March of uh, 2020, just before I wrote about uh, the coronavirus, I said the tradition was that by and large you give fairly extensive deference in order to deal with emergencies. And to some extent, I think those words were correct, but to some extent, I deeply regret them. Uh, the definition of an emergency as it once existed was a short-term situation for which immediate action had to be taken without the possibility of having any deliberation. And if you have that kind of crisis, like you're gonna have a dam that's gonna burst and so forth, you can't go back to the legislature you have to have the executive deal with it. If you're gonna have a huge insurrection like they did during the Civil War, Lincoln basically says, I'm gonna suspend habeas corpus. You don't say, oh no, you have to wait for Congress to do that because by that time, uh, the whole thing is over. What you do is you have executive action, immediate response, and then you could get legislative validation or legislative punishment afterwards. So you hold the president accountable after the fact. What has happened in these circumstances, however, is that the entire issue of the police power has become inextricably tied in with various kinds of politics. And so what we have seen in the United States is that the duration is much too long. You're trying to claim that there are police power emergencies that existed on March 10th still exist on December 10th. And the great tragedy is no matter where you look, whether it's the inept governor in California, Gavin Newsom, or the inept governor in New York, Andrew Cuomo, or the inept governor in Michigan, Gretchen Whitmer, they all have the same kind of autocratic situation in which they do is they tell you that they have consulted with experts, then they tell you what they're gonna do, and then they say, you have to follow. And I think that as the time period gets long and the processes by which they are doing things start to get worse and the mistakes become clear, somebody says, we've got to basically change this particular review. Uh, so given failure, given the extension of time, uh, the deference that you would give to any administrative agency under the police power ought to uh, be reduced. And right now in the Supreme Court and in other courses, there are all sorts of uneasiness about this. And they come in two ways, which are extremely difficult to organize, but which are necessary to the inquiry. Well, the first of them is you start to do is, is there some sort of illicit discrimination? And so if you tell a pool hall that it can take people in, uh, but a religious institution cannot, People are going to ask, it may be that both should be covered one way, both should be covered the other way, but why the difference? Sometimes you can explain the difference. Many times you cannot explain the difference. And so right now there's a real question as to whether or not we're going to ratchet up this particular kind of protection. The second thing is what's quite extraordinary is I think that Mr. Cuomo has probably given a hundred public broadcasts. He has all of these findings I've never seen a report published by the public health authorities in 
New York State or in California, which have said, this is what the situation is. This is the data on which we're relying. This is why we're doing it this way. If you have a disagreement, please let's have a notice and hearing position so that you could start to see. And so what happens is the police powers become extremely autocratic. And generally speaking, uh, the Hayekian instinct starts to apply. If you have essentially one person who dominates the entire proceeding, and things go well, it's great. But if they don't know what they're doing, they're deadly. Or as the old technical maxim goes, there was a little girl who had a little curl right in the middle of forehead. When she was good, she was very, very good. And when she was bad, she was horrid. That's what happens when you get uh, a centralized government. Very, very good. It's wonderful. But on the other hand, horrid. And it turns out, if you're trying to figure out which of these two things is more important, by and large, if it's good, you could survive procedural examination. And if it's hard, you have to have them. Uh, so as Madison said a long time ago, enlightened statesmen may not always be at the helm. And that certainly applies to many of our governors. And that means that you have to slowly ratchet up what's going on. Uh, so many of you sort of want to think about, well, what does it mean to be a libertarian under these circumstances? And, and I'm going to give you a, a working definition, which is not dogmatic, but is nonetheless, I hope, uh, suggestive, and then I'm happy to take questions, which is essentially somebody who puts himself in the classical liberal or the libertarian camp is somebody who believes that all government action ought to be examined under a presumption of error, meaning in effect that you think that by and large, things will go pretty well without them. They have to show why it's coming in. Uh, if you're a very strong libertarian, you won't even allow for taxes. If you're a classical liberal, you will allow for a greater class of justification. But you're always going to be very, very suspicious of one man kind of rule, uh, which doesn't have the sort of explanations that you start to need. Yes, we do know why it is that the certain kinds of immediate crises do require public strength and intervention. But no, we don't know why it is that we ought to give this in every case. And so I've tried to give you some explanation of what I think the science was some of the errors that have been made by large government, some of the errors that have been made by many scientists. It's quite clear that there's a huge political overtone in this. Uh, there is no question that one of the reasons why people have attacked HCQ is that it was endorsed by Donald Trump. That's not a scientific argument. And in fact, what happens is we are basically paying a very high price because in my judgment, the level of uh, difficulties and dislocations associated with the government intervention in this case has been extremely high and that a more careful, thoughtful and systematic approach to the issue would have made it a lot better. And this requires that you know not only the science, you know something about the way in which legal systems and institutions go and something about the basic theory of individual rights. It requires people to have a sensitivity on all of these dimensions. And it turns out that seems to be what's failing on behalf of the very autocratic rules which are taking hold today. And so with that, I'm quite happy to take questions. Thank you, Richard. That was uh, rich as I expected it to be. So we have some questions coming in now. Um, and uh, I just do want to comment that I know that even though the governor of Michigan was very negative about H hydroxy, excuse me, about hydroxychloroquine, she has, however, um, excitedly endorsed support groups for those with COVID. So not to worry if you're in Michigan, you can have a support group, but you can't have any medication that is uh, effective. I mean, people just get too mild, it's too militant. I mean, what you have to do under these circumstances is worry about a presumption of error. And when it comes to the treatment of medicines, the externalities are relatively minor. And so individual choice ought to dominate. And when somebody says, we're going to put you on the doghouse list, um, you could result in the loss of millions of lives. And what's interesting about it is somebody like Fauci, I don't think he gets the medicine right or the science right. I mean, it's really quite extraordinary. You sit in government and you basically, your word is the word of God. And after a while, what you lack is the one thing that is most important in any public official is a sense of self-criticality. And it's just not apparent in the way in which he works or the way in which the CDC works. You look at the Zelenko site and then you look at the CD site on HCQ. Uh, basically, they got a paragraph on it, on the government site. And it's all wrong, or at least vigorously incomplete. So, I mean, I do regard this as something of a, of a challenge that diseases are bad enough. Uh, 
But we've managed to extend this one much further than ought to have been the case. Anyhow, happy to take questions. Sadly, I, I agree with you. On the topic of hydroxychloroquine, we'll, we'll go bigger picture in a minute, but there's a, a question from one of our audience members. She says, is, is hydroxychloroquine banned in California? And if not, do I have the right to demand it if it's medically appropriate, even if my Kaiser doctor refuses? <sighs> I don't think it's banned in California. I know in many places you could get prescriptions. I mean, I have my physician in Illinois. I have one for myself and one for my wife with the, the whole situation. Thank God we haven't had to use it and so forth. Uh, what it is, is it's uh, the FDA does not have banned and not banned. It has disfavored and favored. So you start putting counterindications on something and a black box warning, for example, and then physicians are very reluctant to prescribe because they're afraid that if there's an adverse consequence, it will be attributed first to malpractice, and then the causal question will be resolved against you. So what you do is you simply shut down the level of distribution relative to what it is in other cases. You could look at many a map, uh, which talks about the HCQ intensive jurisdictions against the last one, and the mortality rate is about a tenfold difference. Uh, in the United States, we have no treatment that we recommend to people before they go into hospital. And when they get into the hospital, the treatment has gotten better. There used to be a hasty move to ventilation, which has now, I think, been regarded as counterproductive. Uh, you don't want to do that. But we still have as much as a 15 to 20 percent mortality rate once people get into the hospital, which means that the key thing to do is to keep them out of the hospital. Fauci always endorses a drug called remdesivir, which has to be used in hospital, has to be intravenous. It's frightfully expensive. Uh, hydroxychloroquine you could get for 10 bucks uh, because it's a generic drug and it's been billed millions and millions of times. I mean, I, I find this so frustrating. The doctors that I know who are on this side of the issue, every time they talk to me, they start spitting anger. I mean, you could see the actual smoke coming out of their particular ears. Uh, but what has happened is mainstream media does not want to cover these kinds of debate, which gets us into an issue which I think everybody is acutely aware of today. Uh, which is that if it's only conservative fringe media that will put this stuff out and everybody's regarded as an oddball, it's there. There was the famous illustration. There were, uh, there were three doctors. I remember the names of two of them. One was Simone Gold and another one was named Stella Emanuel. Uh, the latter was a Nigerian doctor who specialized also in doing witchcraft or some things like that. And there was a third man who was with them and they got on the steps of the Capitol uh, there, a video went viral explaining that they had used HCQ with perfect success, maybe an exaggeration, and so forth. And within a day, Miss Gold was fired from her position. Miss Emanuel was excoriated, and YouTube took down the situation. Why did they take it down? Because they said, our standard of what is false is anything that disagrees with the World Health Organization. And, you know, the First Amendment says the reason why you want to have dissent is because the World Health Organization can be wrong when it starts to deal with these things. And we want a free and robust debate. And if somebody wants to put up stuff which says we think their statistics is wrong, uh, this constant dogmatic insistence that everything is settled and that we know it all is in fact an extremely dangerous way to start to appeal. So you see doctors getting canned. Um, it's not banned, right? But as we understand, uh, there are ways that you could put burdens and taxes and disadvantages to certain kinds of treatments which are short of banned, but nonetheless have an extremely powerful situation. One of the things you always worry about when you're a lawyer is essentially when somebody is prohibited from banning something as a government agency, do they try to find some other lesser device which will allow them to circumvent the prohibition and put restrictions on them? That's why law is so difficult because it's a constant game. You get one guy trying to do something, the other guy takes an evasive move, then the first guy tries to stop him. Uh, but you cannot say in the, uh, in the abstract is which of these guys is the good guys and which of these guys is the bad guys. But you teach in the Internal Revenue Code, half of this situation is government over taxation, followed by some evasive strategy, which then becomes abusive, then you close the loophole, then you create another loophole. That dynamism takes place, and that's exactly what's happened with respect to HCQ. So even if it's not banned in California, it may be more difficult to get a prescription than it should. And it's certainly not being encouraged by its use. And indeed, it's not even the case where you just simply put out all the evidence and say, here is a platform, here are the pros, here are the cons. Ladies and gentlemen, you start to do, to do it. And, and you know, hearing the other side is the single most important, these old Roman maxims, Audi, Alter, and Partum. Hear the other side. 
And if somebody says, well, WHO does it, it's over, you're hearing only one side of a debate. And that gets to the kind of difficulty with constitutional principles that everybody should be upset about. That is a, that is a chant we should roar. Richard, we have a lot of questions coming in, so I'm gonna shoot some at you, okay, so that we can sure. get to as many people as possible. Uh, our member, uh, Teresa says, often uh, on, the right, on rights and liberties, often we hear, quote, one person's rights and where another uh, neighbor's rights, well, excuse me, one person's rights ends where another person's rights begins. But clearly this has not been the case with COVID. The rights of all have been subjugated preemptively, she says, for a so-called pandemic that has a 99% recovery rate. Is it legal? And, or did we just comply with something even though it's not legal? Okay, well, first of all, you know, the quaint maxim that one always has to deal with in the first place is you want to have a parity of right amongst individuals. And so what we say typically as a good libertarian is the rights of liberties, the greatest liberties that we could have that are coextensive with the like liberties of other individuals. And that we then have that. And then we have a second rule which says that we don't play favorites so that one person is not going to be better off or worse off than anybody else. That is, people are all on a rough plane of parity. And so then the first question is, how do you give the substantive content to that parity notion? And the initial rule is you can't kick other people in the head. And so whether you start with the Roman system or the English system or any other system in the face of the world, the first task of every civilization is to control the use of force and aggression without which social life could not exist. Now, force has a little sister, a little cousin, and that's called nuisance. And what nuisances are, I'm not gonna kill you, but I'm gonna emit an odor or a stink or noise or vibration that go onto your particular property. And the question is, how do we stop them? It's a very complicated issue to give it the simplest version is the big ones we treat like they're force and the small ones that are reciprocal, we let us survive under a live and let live regime. Then you try to apply this to quarantine. And so if we had a very simple case where we know if you are sick and you are in the same room with somebody else, you will kill them. We will treat this as though it's a case of fraud or force. Right? But if it turns out there's a low probability that you have something and a low probability that somebody else has something, uh, we don't know whether the right reciprocal rules, we can both go in public or we neither of us can go into public. And what the question asks is the right way, if the probabilities of the infection are extremely low, then in effect, what you're probably better off is allowing both people to engage in activities freely than shutting them down. What makes it very difficult in the uh, uh, contagion cases is there's no effective damage remedy after the fact. Uh, so in the standard situation, if you're walking down the street and somebody hits you over the head with a brick, whether it be accident on purpose, we know whom to turn to. But if you go out on the street and you meet a thousand people and you have no idea of them, which of them have the disease and which of them gave it to you, essentially the damage remedy is out uh, as an effective device. And so then you're left only to prohibitions. And how do you fashion them? It's, you could stop everybody from going on the street. You could let them on the street if they wear a mask. You could let them on the street if they keep certain distances. You could let them on the street if they take certain kinds of tests. And the reason the system is so difficult is the principle of reciprocity doesn't tell us which of these things we want. And in general, if you take the position that I do, and that these high-risk populations ought to be sheltered, you don't have to tell them they have to stay home. I have many friends, um, you know, at my certain age, when you're in your 70s, who have disabilities, who haven't been out for the longest period of time because they know that they have to self-select because if they get the disease, the, the death rate or the injury rate is very, very high. And so you would rely on the self-selection mechanism. Uh, but the other position is in order to protect anybody, we have to protect everybody, which then gets the excessive locks down. And that's where the battle is. I have consistently come down on the side of the lesser interventions and it gets pilloried and abused. The, the great Barrington trio has been you know, vilified in the press and so forth. I think they have more of the truth than everybody else. Uh, but one of the things that you have to do when you're engaged in remedial discussions, what sort of injunctions you put into place and so forth, is you have to be alert to changes in local conditions and circumstances and be prepared to update your particular prohibitions in either direction as new information starts to come in. And that's why you need some real expertise and some open discussion. 
Um, but what happens is we don't get that kind of discussion because our administrative processes, as I've mentioned to you, are completely shut off. So uh, this is a very, very difficult question. And a libertarian, you believe in reciprocity and you believe in independence and you believe in the prohibition against harm. When things become uncertain, it's harder to apply those principles than it is in an ordinary case where, you know, you know pretty much what to do. So to give you another illustration, Jane answered my question, is when do we let people on a public highway? Well, we don't keep everybody off, but we don't let six-year-olds drive. We don't let blind people drive. And if you want to drive a truck, you have to get a special license. You want to drive a car, you get a license. So we basically limit who can get on the road. Then we find people, right, if they're the wrong kind, or we suspend their licenses. And then we give tort remedies to people who violate the rules. Just think of this as a very simple system. And you have four or five devices working at the same time. And you get subcategorizations, multiple licenses, multiple sanctions, multiple everything. And is things getting better or worse? Well, they're getting better. Why? And this is something which, again, we haven't been able to quite master with the COVID situation. As the technology gets better, the safety records get stronger, and you can start to relax some of the legal prohibitions. And as the roads get better and wider and so forth, the accident rates start to go down. If you look at this stuff, it's amazing how much safer things are than 25 years ago. It's the law has not much changed in this period. What drives you to safety is improved technology. Okay. Well, speaking of technology, um, I'm not sure if this is a technical question or actually. Who knows? Well, well this is a, a com yeah. Uh, Shelly wants to know, she, she shares that she has friends that went to get tested, uh, but didn't want to wait for hours. And then the next day they received a notice that they tested positive, but they never took the test, Richard. So could you want to speak to uh, what's going on with the Oh my God, I mean, one of the things that you have is that every system has a distribution problem. And trying to figure out how it is that you administer vaccines and texts is extremely difficult. And this is one of the problems that happens with big governments. Uh, you get 330 million plus people in the United States, many of them clamoring for vaccines and for tests. You get harried administrators, uh, it's a bookkeeping problem, which you have to start from scratch because you don't have a tax roll record, an income tax record, and so forth. The rates of error are going to be very, very high. So that's the first thing. The question that she asked, though, has a more ominous side to it, which is when you do these things, are the errors systematic or are they random? Uh, so, for example, if people get back tests that they haven't taken and 98% of them are negative, just like the regular population, and 2% are positive, well, you say it's just a screw up. But if it turns out that all of the things that are reported are positive for tests that you have and have, uh, then you have to ask, is there some kind of quirk, some kind of bias within the system and so forth? And then that gets you to the question is just how technical as opposed to how ideological do many of these health systems start to be? And my view about health is you want to be a technician. You want to essentially figure out how you can minimize the error flow in this stuff. But what happens today is we get huge amounts of equity issues being engendered into differentials by race, by sex, various groups being under and overrepresented. It leads to a certain political stuff. And then you kind of get very strange choices. So, for example, we know uh, that men are more susceptible to COVID than women. Um, this is true in virtually every age group and so forth. It's a 55-45 split, give or take, and so forth. Why is that? because women have stronger immune systems, which is why they suffer more from autoimmune diseases. It's kind of an overreaction of the system. Well, do you want to treat this as sex discrimination or a fact of life? And then you have the questions about race. It does turn out uh, that the amount of vitamin C and D that you have in the system seems to influence uh, the amount of resistance you have. If you're darker skinned, whether you're a very Brahmin-like Indian or an American black uh, from a poor family, you're going to have less of this stuff. The likelihood is that the damages are going to be greater. What you try to do is not spend your time denouncing people. You try to tell people who are in higher risk categories the things they ought to do. And one of the things that you've never seen is a real emphasis on the part of government saying, uh, particularly if you're dark skin, uh, what you should do is take more of these things because what happens is uh, sunlight um, is so intense in lower regions that it's harder for things to get through. That's why you have darker skin. And this is going to be a disability under these particular circumstances. So um, I, I really believe that when 
has to try and keep the equity and the political stuff out of this. And your basic maxim, I mean, it sounds so simple, but what you're trying to do in all these cases is to minimize the number of deaths uh, given the resources that you have available. And I'm an old line utilitarian in the following maxim, which is that each person counts for one and only one. So the question that you then ask is, well, can you buy your way to the top of the queue and so forth? And in certain situations, it clearly cannot be done. Triage is essentially a system in which you use non-market allocation. And the reason you do so is it's an emergency situation. And so people are going to get better anyhow, quote unquote, you let them take care of themselves. People who are hopeless, no reason to waste resources on them. So you spend all your resources where it going to give you the greatest rate of return. With vaccines, it's never been discussed as to whether or not we allow people to sort of buy preferences if they're high income, high producing people. And one of the things that might have actually helped this situation is instead of having large amounts of vaccines go to waste because we get these political log jams and the same kinds of mistakes in giving vaccines as we have in giving tests, these things die, is if you could have a system in which somebody can say, well, we've just got 100,000 of these units, we're putting them out to bid so you know the people are gonna come and get them. We're gonna take all that money and we're gonna spend it to try to improve the rest of the system to give it to everybody else. It could easily be win-win. But what's so characteristic about this system is any kind of partial market solution to any of these questions is ruled out of bounds to begin with. I think that's probably a mistake. Mind you, I said partial market solution. Uh, but I think in fact, when I look at the race question, I have the following question to ask people. We know the differential impacts that have multiple and uncertain etiologies, uh, but can you find any cases in which somebody has been turned down for care at a public or a private institution because of race, creed, religion, and national origin? And I will guarantee almost to a certainty that you can't find a single case that fails that particular question. And you know, that's a great achievement. And so rather than starting to denounce the healthcare system, I think one ought to praise it to the extent that it does try and help everybody. And since this is a kind of a life and death issue, most people recognize, long recognized, even in libertarian circles, um, your ability to pay is not a measure of the utility of your life when you're in these life and death situations, which is why we have charitable institutions of one kind or another, because people understand this and they contribute their money to help the welfare of their sisters and brothers and so forth. And they're being, we don't see much of that being understood today. There's just much too much criticism of the system and much too much rigidity in the way in which it operates. Uh, we need to basically decentralize the distribution. My guess is if we had thought a little bit harder as to how you run the distribution, we would have had some market components in there and we would have had a higher production of vaccines and a greater savings in lives um, all the way up and down the income wealth and age distributions. Okay, so uh, would you, there are a couple of people who are asking about mandated vaccines. Would you speak to the government mandating that you have a vaccination? Sure. To go I to mean, work, go to school, et cetera? Yeah, look, the, let's just start with the historical case, which everybody starts to refer to, a case called Jacobson against Massachusetts. And what happened is there was a statement very broad that under the government peace power, we can force you to take a vaccine. And it turns out that's not the case. If you looked at the particular situation, there was an epidemic of smallpox in, I think it was Cambridge, Massachusetts. And some fellow said, when I was a child, I had this huge complication with vaccines. I don't want to take it. If you mandate the system to everybody, including those people who are highly at risk to vaccination, uh, it could be a death warrant. That was never what was at issue there. What was issue in Jacobson was whether or not the guy had to pay a $5 fine in order to get out. Now, you put the system in a slightly different fashion, saying, look, we understand that some people need to get out. We know that wealth is not a perfect proxy. Uh, but in fact, if it turns out that you want to pay $5 to escape the vaccination, we'll let you get out. You may want to say you have to show some medical cause to do it. You may not. These things are very difficult, but you want to do it. It's very different from the cases that came later which said that if you wish to go to public school, you must get a vaccine, right? Because at this point, there's no opt-out. We're going to cut you out of a public education. And at that point, you have to build in some kind of exception for people of exceptional sensitivity. When you start going further on vaccines, it gets even worse. 
um, because the history of vaccines in the last 15 years has been very unhappy. There was a doctor in England named Andrew Wakefield who published a series of studies which indicated that the DPT vaccine, having to deal with the diphtheria, uh, pertussis, and typhoid, in fact, they were bound together by mercury, and he claimed that mercury caused autism. This was a study financed by plaintiff's lawyers in an effort to sue these companies, and it was retracted 12 years later. It was in the lens of the same guys who published the bogus study about HCQ, which they had to attract. And in the people, you develop a very strong anti-vaxxer movement that comes up because of the bad kind of science. And so now what you're doing is you're saying, well, do we need the mandate to overcome the misinformation or do you need other kinds of information? Generally speaking, my view is you would not want to put the mandate. And what's the evidence for this? Well, you look now at the shortages and as best I can see, uh, every single website that I've observed has said, how can I get myself to the head of the queue as opposed to how it is I could get myself off the queue? Uh, so if you have a situation in this case where there's a line to get the vaccine, why would you want to mandate it when in fact volunteerism will get you all the health that you need? And by the way, this is somewhat surprising to me. If you looked at some of the studies and the criticisms of the studies that were done for the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccine, there were all sorts of people who said, well, you're testing it on the wrong subset of the population. And we don't know whether or not uh, you've got the right titrations or what variations you need for age group. All that stuff seems to be put aside. When I speak to my physician friend, um, they treat it as kind of liberation. That I got my vaccine today. Uh, they don't treat this as a disability. So mandating under these circumstances is absolutely crazy. If somebody wants to stay out, anybody who gets the vaccine can protect themselves. So you have to worry about the fact that there are going to be some people who don't get the vaccine or in a very low risk of group for the COVID who may be injured by one of these people who don't take it. Um, that sort of negative externality is a very low probability. So the correct answer is don't do it here. Um, uh, I'm old enough to remember 1954. I don't think you are, Jane. Um, but I mean, I remember when the, fourth, the salt vaccine came out. Hmm. Yeah, you people just sort of lined up around the block. I mean, the thought that you had to mandate this when you had shortages, no, because it was a transformation. I mean, 1953, cases of COVID, they shut down all the beaches in New York City and so forth. I mean, it was just a feel. There was, there was more trust at that time, was there not? Well, yes, it is. And in fact, this is also something which is sort of deeply troublesome. Uh, there are systematic patterns about distrust. And African-Americans tend to have larger distrust of these public systems than do a white and Asian people. And if the systems are working well, that's gonna cost very dearly. And so what you really need to do today, I think is to try to build the system of trust up again. And if you have these constant attacks and that the system is corrupt, it's biased, it's racist and so forth, what you're gonna do is increase the suspicion and you're going to, if vaccines have a positive use, you're going to slow down the dissemination to the populations that may need it most. And so I think it's really very, very important. I mean, it's a desperate plea uh, for people not to try to rip down a system, which I think has tried to work very, very well in terms of its motivations and so forth, but try to improve the day-to-day -day operations so that we can avoid these crazy cases in which people have given reported as being positive and negative for tests that they've never taken and things like that. You have to spend your time making sure that you get the gunk out of the gears uh, so that when the system moves, it moves with a greater degree of reliability. Uh, that's the biggest problem with this vaccine situation now is our distribution channels have been backed off. And New York State, again, is a leader in screwing all this stuff up in, in terms of what's going on. And as I said, markets to some extent would help solve that, but that seems to be off the table today. And as I said to you, you can have a mixed system and it's probably one that would give you a higher level of human welfare than the system that we now have. Okay. Uh, one of our, I could keep going with for you with another half an hour. I just want to keep you for a few more minutes if we could, Richard. Okay, that, I'm look, I mean, I'm up. I, I noticed the audience is slowly dwindling away. Um, I mean, people have other things to do with their lives than to listen to me opine. Well, we're enjoying your opining. Um, uh, there's a, Sylvia wants to know, uh, why is Bill Gates so involved with Fauci and the, the push for vaccinations? To her, it seems nefarious. 
Um, found, I mean, look, the Gates Foundation has a very long time uh, position. They have always been champions of vaccines at one way or another, because what they've done, I've actually spoken to some people there. Their attitude is we try to treat a condition after it has occurred. You spend thousands of dollars on a single case and the number of expected useful life years that you get out of it is negligible. And in fact, there's a notion called qualities, um, which essentially has to do with the quality adjusted life years, Q-A-L-Y. And uh, it turns out that end of life treatment for sick people uh, saves very few qualities, There's very few years, and they often very, very bad. If you can vaccine, think of it this way. You could spend $100,000 taking a 22 year old kid who's seriously ill and get them to live to 24. Or you can take $100,000, the same dollars, and vaccinate 1,000 kids. And what happens is you will prevent, say, a third of them from getting a disease, and their life expectancy goes from 8 to 80. And so the vaccine to the, to, the, to the Gates Foundation is just a straight cost benefit analysis in which the odds are very, very heavily weighted in that fashion. And they're not hospitals. So they don't have this constant end of life problem, which is do we continue to supply services at public expense to people so that an extra day in the emergency room will cost you $25,000, which could be spent on a vaccine program or a school food program and so forth and give you a much higher rate of return. And you know, I've often been against this intensive care type situation, the heroism, and the Gates Foundation has done it. Now, they also have lots of other political agendas that you may or may not disagree with. But in general, I think that their instincts about this is pretty sound. And look, let's remember who got this right amongst the various people. It was Donald Trump who called for Operation Warp Speed. And all the competitors or the critics said, you'll never get this done in that kind of time. It's not just enough, Jane, to call for this. What's absolutely critical in these situations is how you structure the incentives. And so one of the things you could do if you're a progressive is give drug companies millions of dollars to develop this stuff. And they'll spend it and you may or you may not get anything. It's gonna be like all the solar energy programs, right? You give the subsidy and who knows what come out. But what the Trump administration did, it may have been Mike Pence, who's very good on these kinds of things, is they say, we'll pay you for the finished product. We're not going to pay you anything by way of a general subvention. At that point, the risk of failure falls on the company and they'll do everything they can to minimize it. And so the level of production that you start to see take place is astonishingly rapid relative to everybody's expectation. It proves once again, in public health situation, incentives really matter. And this is one in which they got the administration got it right. I mean, Pence ran a very good office with respect to this stuff. I mean, there are people who want to call him a kind of adult. And, you know, he isn't adult. He's a, maybe not the most animated and exciting person on the favor of the world. But when it comes to running complex institutions, I want soundness. I don't want flair. And I, I think that the administration did a very good job there. And I just wish somebody would thank them for this, because then you watch the states bungle it in terms of the way in which the distributions, New York, as usual, in the lead. Well, I'm going to ask one last question. I'm going to combine a question with our uh, audience member, Judith. She wants to know if there's a way to demand that government salaries are also impacted by closures. There are too many people, she says, making decisions that are not affected by their own decisions. Richard, I'm going to combine that with a question that I've had about standing. Sure. Um, as a layperson, I don't under, you know, who will have standing? We have so many uh, things that we're looking forward to and really not looking forward to. An increased death rate is, uh, you know, the R and D that's not happening, uh, the inaccessible health care, the people that delayed their mammograms, etc. Kids are behind in school. Uh, organizations are failing because they can't they can't gather. There's no right to assembly, evidently. Um, so, could you could churches obviously? Could you talk about the people that are making decisions versus the people whose lives they are affecting? Well, what happens is, generally speaking, the following maxim is true. Any defect you have in the structure of social organizations becomes much more dangerous as the calamities that you face become much more serious. And so the way in which the American system is done on labor contracts, it turns out that two classes of workers, by and large, get protection against downturn that ordinary people do not. They are government employees, often represented by unions, and then to a lesser extent, uh, some private union workers get these kinds of priorities and protections. 
If the economy is working pretty well, these protections are not all that important because everything is stable. But when things start to go down, then the priority really matters. And you see exactly what you see. People see that there are no reductions in, in government wages, notwithstanding that the tax revenues are down, and that ordinary people are basically being forced to mortgage their wedding rings in order to keep their restaurants open and so forth. And, and this gets you into a very, very deep problem. And my attitude on this has always been the same. Um, I have always said that to the extent that there's compulsory unionism, either in government or in the private sector, it's just flat out unconstitutional. In the private sector, it interferes with freedom of contract in a competitive market. And in a public sector, it's essentially taking general revenues and diverting them to your favorite friends in violation of the public trust under which all monies ought to be spent. And so that is essentially, I think, the substance of the other point actually ties in very closely to the first one. You asked about standing. Uh, you didn't distinguish between standing and sovereign immunity. And well, I'll put the two of them together because, in fact, they have a common thing. You go back to 1923, and there's a famous case called Frothingham and Mellon, coupled with another famous case called Massachusetts against Mellon. And it was a very, very simple question. There was a maternity act that was passed which promised that the federal government would give sums of money to pregnant women and to their children. And it was repealed a few years later. In the interim, it was challenged by the state of Massachusetts and by Mrs. Frothingham. And she said, this is an illegal expenditure because under the federal taxing power, any money that you spend has to go for public goods. It can't be transferred to individual people. And what happened is Justice Sutherland writing for the Supreme Court said, Nobody has standing to challenge these things because everybody is hurt by them. So what you did is you had a very important government program that was allowed to go without challenge. And this became the constant situation. If you wish to challenge the constitutionality of a program, and the only thing you could say is that you're a citizen or a taxpayer, you don't have standing. That's not the rule in England. It's not the rule in most state courts. It's just an outright blunder. Um, if you look at the power of the Supreme Court to decide cases in law and equity, equity means the ability to give injunctions against activities that are ultra virus. Uh, Sutherland got it desperately wrong. Then on top of that, you get sovereign immunity. And so originally the rule was that the king could do no wrong. And that got moved into the United States by saying the government could do no wrong. And so the only way you could sue the government was with its consent. And the government gave it occasionally privately, but often not. And then in 1946, you had the Federal Torts Claims Act, which allowed private individuals to sue. But it carved out from that uh, those actions which government took as part of a discretionary function. So you got immunity. So even if you were somebody who was hit by a train and it was a government function that was discretionary, you couldn't recover. So you put the two things together, very broad discretionary function exception, very tough standing rules, it turns out that you can't get to these government giveaways because they're either discretionary functions on the one hand or nobody has standing on which to deal with it. So essentially what happens is the view is that if you're talking about automobile accidents, you have a fair shot. But if you're trying to talk about a program in which you have to exercise judgment as to who's going to get a vaccine and when, uh, the discretionary function exception kills you at the federal level. States have more or less the same kinds of rules. They also have very long emergency situations. So what we have done, and this has accounted in large part for the huge expansion in government, is we have created a situation where citizens are unable to attack illegal actions of the government um, over a very, very wide spread of circumstances. And this then leads to the expansion of the general government size of state. Uh, you then throw into this the fact that the takings clause uh, doesn't apply when you're dealing with generalized regulation on the zoning of similar statutes. And what you see is that the American Constitution has been read on all sorts of technical grounds to make it impossible for ordinary citizens to stop what you would think to be illegal action. And as I said, in ordinary times, it may not matter that much. But boy, oh boy, as you see suit after suit going down in flames because of these particular doctrines, it makes you realize that these are, in many cases, huge structural errors. So I hope on that unhappy note, um, I've given at least some information about how this system is put together. Richard, you have. Uh, it's a complete treat. I, I don't know what, what other word to use. It's a complete treat to have you here tonight. 
And I just so hope that you will come back and visit us in person perhaps next year. Well, perhaps sometime we will. But in the meantime, the hour is late. I think what I'm going to do is go to sleep. Thank you all for listening. I, it's always a good sign when you manage to keep, you know, 90% of your audience for 90% of your time. Indeed. <laughs> okay. So thank, thank you, you audience, for, I, I, for being so anonymously attentive. 